Okay, thanks a lot for having me do this. Uh, I'll, the first part of this is, is kind of boilerplate stuff. So if you have any questions, I mean, that's fine. But um, I'll, I'll sort of alert you when I'm adding sort of the newer and more controversial stuff uh, to the the talk. But I just start by giving sort of a, an introduction of, uh, of how to bring ecological into, economics into, especially environmental economics courses, but also courses in a public policy um, that I taught. Um, insight I think ecological economics brings is that the human economy is embedded within the biophysical world and in social institutions. So, uh, uh, teachers was Nicholas Czerczewski Roche, and he was a very, uh, you know, very smart mind and analytical. The standard definition of economics is science of the allocation of scarce resources among alternative ends. Okay, situations, a lot of problems that that's, uh, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing wrong with that. It's essentially uh, with an individual making investment decisions, making consumption decisions at a point in time. But actually, uh, started with Sergescu and, and especially Herman Daly's critique of the depiction of an, of an economy, circular flow, no resources going in and no waste coming out. So, this is shown in the, um, the left hand uh, panel there. Uh, and so, it's a circular flow between uh, consumers and producers, the theory of allocation, which is some very strict, uh, strict medical properties in the basic model. So, uh, economics did from the start was sort of uh, spread the ethical boundaries to, to have it include uh, the right-hand side, too, the natural environment represented by the trees and a human society and, uh, as uh, social uh, creatures. So, uh, again, coming to Jescu and, uh, and Herman Daly, uh, a circular flow, you get a more linear system. So, the first book uh, published in 1971, the Epic Law and the Economic Process. And the 70s, this is when, uh, again, uh, ecological economics really started with Mr. Jescu's work, uh, Kenneth Golding, The Economics of the Coming Spaceship on Earth. And it's Herman's uh, books on steady state economics. Uh, so the, the point that that, that some work uh, makes clear is that uh, resources are finite. The economy depends on the flow of resources from the natural world. And uh, it ends up uh, in the Earth's system that uh, resource sinks. So resource going in, pollution uh, coming out. It's really a one-way flow. And thing, um, what I do, with, especially with environmental economics, uh, I start with a long-term perspective on the place of humans in the natural world. Uh, the percent of human history we lived as hunter-gatherers in communities that were egalitarian and sustainable. So the point of some uh, video clips on hunter-gatherers. Another point is the market is a, a very recent uh, human and been human institution. So an important paper by uh, Joseph Henrich and some others uh, called uh, uh, had the tiered societies in the title. We're Western, uh, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. Uh, you know, these are it turns out these are very peculiar uh, problems of, of human society. So the bottom line, I think, of, uh, of both those things is that uh, we need skeptical about claims of human nature uh, on both sides, really. I mean, humans are not naturally gracious and greedy and so on, and really naturally loving and kind and altruistic either. Uh, and these different characteristics are emphasized or de-emphasized depending on particular society. So, again, bring to teaching is uh, the importance of ne uh, neoclassical theory and no teaching whether it's a policy course or environmental economics or uh, economics or whatever. I spent a lot of time on uh, the intellectual history of welfare economics and how it was a unified system of thought, how pieces fit together, consumption theory, production theory, how these come together, uh, 
Talk about that fits in all the stool, uh, tools of standard economics uh, come in with the market analysis, discounting, and future growth mounting, and so forth. Uh, uh, really, just in the, past, the data that's come in the, in the past few years is, uh, is really astonishing, both in terms of climate change, uh, loss of the non human nature. Here's a, uh, I try to work into almost every lecture I give. It shows uh, the temperature and CO2 record over the last half million years or so. And it's kind of an old slide. Uh, some new papers have taken this back to about a million years. So there's a bunch of things in that slide. Blue is temperature, green is CO2. But it's a relationship between atmospheric CO2 and temperature. And really jumps out is that uh, the far uh, left hand uh, part of that blue squiggle, the last 10,000 years have been really incredibly stable. This is the Holocene uh, really made agriculture possible, uh, and so on. So everything really changed with this warm climate. But it was, there have been periods, as you can see, the climate was as warm, but these were really spikes. And that was the first time you had this. So thousands of years history of a stable climate and a warm climate. The thing that jumps out is the spike in, in CO2 um, in recent years. Uh, this is an important point to make, too. We almost always, when people talk about increased CO2, they talk about the increase uh, over pre-industrial levels as since the uh, you know, 800 or so. A really important point to make is most of that has been really recent. Most of that green spike at the end has been has happened within my lifetime, you know, 1950 or so. Uh, not 50 into World War II, uh, CO2 levels were probably around 300. And most honestly, probably about half that increase has come within the lifetime of a uh, green uh, to this lecture. So it's very recent, it, you know, it's really radical change. And if it, uh, again, the stability of the uh, of CO2 emissions for the last million years, it's been 200 and 280. Uh, and that was out of really warm periods and ice ages. So all the climate change is that, that green spike. And we really don't know what the consequences are going to be, but they're, uh, they're bound to be disruptive. Thing is sort of the uh, the effect of um, human activity on biomass, Holocene, uh, and again, especially the last uh, few decades. Okay, this, this is from uh, uh, some um, work by Vaclav ba Smil. So this one shows uh, the percentage of the of biomass of humans uh, 10,000 years ago. <coughs> it, it really doesn't show up there. You can, if you use a fine glass, there's a thin red line right at part of that, uh, top of that purple uh, triangle, where a minor player, uh, the pop human population uh, never exceeded uh, just a few million, probably one to four million from the, uh, the Pleistocene. Uh, by year 1900, uh, and again, talking mostly organic agriculture, then, this is before fields really kicked in, uh, even by 1900, humans and their family. Which is blue, uh, ruminated uh, by on Earth. The last one shows um, the situation in uh, 2015. And um, the total biomass has increased by about six fold because of the, the dumping in of fossil fuels to grow crops and raise farm animals. Uh, just this, this tremendous impact on, on the Earth's biosphere just in the past few decades. Uh, so, so a new information coming out is the, the sort of the decimation, it really biodiversity so much, just, just a wiping out of other animals. The total uh, number of men has declined by about half since 1970. It's insects, fish in the ocean, birds, and so on. So something happening uh, just in the last Few decades, and it seems to be accelerating. 
Okay, I'll shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about uh, behavioral economics. This was an area I was really uh, into a few years ago. And uh, it's a field that's uh, really almost taken economics by, by storm. And it's changed the way a lot of people sort of think about the economy and uh, uh, relevant policy and so on. Uh, a, a game theory. And uh, one thing that really changed things was an article by uh, Werner Goose in 1982. Uh, he developed something called the ultimatum game. So talk about uh, that, uh, the role of nudging and changing economic behavior, and then sort of going beyond that to talk about the limits uh, of banks um, of, of in terms of policy. Just listen to the, the final thing I want to talk about, which is the role of government and this sort of government versus the market myth. This part, uh, again, feel free to ask questions here. Uh, so the item game, it's pretty simple. Suppose one gives you $100 and asks you to share it with some unknown person. You're not sure you, as little as you like, but the person you give the share to can reject the offer, and that can either of you get anything. And the person knows, I mean, if it's between the two of us, there, uh, if someone gives me $100, ask me to share it with you. I can give you a I can give you $50, I can give you $10. If you don't like offer, you reject it, neither one of us uh, anything. The standard model, <coughs> the model of economic man, and he is a man, you know, so, and so uh, an economic man uh, would offer the minimum, and any positive um, offer would be accepted. More to less, and so on. So keep ninety-nine dollars. You give you a dollar. You're happy because you have a dollar you hadn't had before. I'm sure it's quite familiar with the market economies. The typical offer is around 50, uh, 40 percent. Any less than thirty percent uh, is usually rejected. Uh, Stats have been consistently found in hundreds of studies in a variety of settings and cultures, and sort of a number of variations. On this model, so this really one of the sort of the drivers of the standard economic model is what's called self-regarding preferences. So it undermines uh, again uh, the consistent part of the uh, neoclassical theory. Enrich, I mentioned before, in the weird societies. Uh, anthropologists who actually started out as an economist, undergraduate degrees in economics, and he went on to get a PhD in anthropology. Uh, he got a MacArthur Foundation with some economists, including uh, Sam Wilson and Herb Gintis and some others. And they played a game in 15 different cultures. Interesting paper with interesting results. Um, the bottom line was the, the this is canani canonical model of self-interested behavior is not supported in any society study. Now, there was varied a lot. I mean, some, some cultures gave very high offers, and these these offers were rejected. Other cultures gave low offers and they were accepted. But you uh, had to understand how the, the different economies in these cultures work to make good predictions. Uh, Kevin McCabe is in this evolutionary group I'm involved in. But this is kind of a <coughs> one of the variations. <coughs> he put them, gave them game in two groups. And, and one, he just had a little diagram that looked like this. This is three dots that looking like a face. Students, subjects who had this diagram near them made significantly higher offers. I mean, you had, again, subconsciously, whatever you felt like you were being watched, and just this made you make higher offers. Anything, you know, stuff that made them game. This kind of, uh, uh, of it's really important in, uh, in environmental processes like climate. Uh, you know, we all know this, really. You know, facts may not be as important as uh, the least some in your peer group. You know, conservative white male in the South, uh, your peers are not likely to believe in climate change. So the cost to you of expressing your concern, concern about global warming, you lose respect of your peer group to some extent. What are the benefits of, you know, standing outside your group? You know, probably really none. I mean, one person uh, doesn't make that much difference. So um, people are use uh, social context in terms of environmental policy, and they're really uh, impressive uh, results. The program is 
use of a house with solar panels in California. And some of there's a subdivision there that one of the all the houses had solar panels. This was one of the selling points. People got to design their houses before they were built and they talked about the location of the solar panels. The surprising thing that came out is that of the uh, the homeowner wanted the solar panels on the front of the house, even though in many cases it was better to have them at the rear in terms of the amount of sun they captured and southern facing exposure and all that. But they want panels where their neighbors could see them that they had solar panels, environmentally conscious and all that. Yeah, here's examples. Uh, a few years ago, Texas had, had a, a real problem with littering. Um, they had a, a really good consultant group come in and uh, they studied the problem. They found out who was doing the, the littering and sort of had focus on that peer group. And uh, it turned out that a lot of the littering <coughs> was done by, you know, say, sort of red and white males driving around in their pickup trucks and throwing beer bags out the window. A lot of my relatives in Texas would fall into that group, so I'm not going to sign this, uh, you know, this slogan, don't mess with Texas, is sort of macho saying, real men don't pollute and all that. And it worked. And once they flipped that group, uh, then uh, the, the littering problem in Texas uh, was solved. But it, it's, uh, it's amazing that it's changed. Successes. Limitations. And, uh, I'll just talk about uh, a few of these. Uh, there's a lot of work by behavioral uh, kind of obesity. And it's a, a quote from a newspaper article. He won a Nobel Prize a few years ago by his work in behavioral economics and, and what's changing. Uh, and he's okay. So this is from a newspaper. Article. They were important for understanding obesity precisely because he brought the discipline of understanding why people make seemingly irrational choices. So, uh, obesity is seen as a failure of self control, but the work um, really points out that self control really is unusual. Most people make daily long choices based on what, what's easy and what's immediately uh, pleasing. Um, work on obesity he talks about sort of the evolutionary aspects of it. Again, we hunter gatherers, we have a craving for fat and salt because it was hard to come by in a, a scale environment. There's nothing uh, wrong with that, but it misses, I think, um, part showing the, uh, the, the academic, epidemic is really uh, pretty recent. Uh, again, it's the first uh, down there. Age groups in 1974. So it's gone up. Obesity percentage has gone up from about 5% to uh, percent just in that, whatever it is, 34 year period. So what, what happened? I mean, were people more rational in the 1970s or 1980s? I mean, I think so. So there must be some other factors, some social factors uh, that explain it. And, you know, the, uh, the sugar industry subsidy these to the sugar industry that's been mentioned uh, as a cause. Uh, photos with a lot of sugar, um, the attention of fast food restaurants, uh, and, and so on. The kind of food and fast food restaurants to, to make this craving that people want to eat. Whatever the reasons, there's some institutional factors, some government policy uh, factors that work there that need to be uh, added to some of the individual behavioral explanation. One uh, along the same lines is addiction. Economists have applied economic reasoning at the individual uh, level. Gary Becker has talked about rational addiction uh, and so on. Um, but again, they tend to focus on it. In the last uh, 20 years or so, um, 2,000 institutional factors going on. Okay, so another topic I copied from a newspaper article. Uh, <coughs> and this is an article about the final report 
board of the President Trump's Commission on Combating Drug Abuse. You know, pretty grew, but they really uh, the drug industry for um, deliberately aggressive marketing and sponsored uh, physician conferences aimed at expanding opioid use by minimizing the dangers of, uh, of addiction. Um, so, you know, they would encourage uh, doctors to prescribe these opiates. Uh, the number of prescription drugs has you know, mushroomed in the, in the past few uh, decades because of this. Um, again, it's, it's just sort of the response, and this response of this commission that came out <clears throat> was to actually uh, give the industry more money to, to develop uh, what they call abuse deterrent opiates that are just that they're as addictive as the original opiates, but not as damaging. So, again, a matter of individual behavior, you have to over something over the terms of the institutional factors, the publicities that uh, sort of spawned uh, this phenomenon. Um, it has to do with sustainability. And I did quote this in here because some of the, some of the quotes are from pretty prominent ecological economists. But in a lot of literature, unsustainable behavior is blamed on uh, individuals or human nature. Naturally greedy and selfish, uh, these uh, rabid gathers sort of march across the planet, uh, overkill, which I can happen based on some recent recent studies of uh, climate and extinction of large mammal species. But anyway, you know, the real problem is the economic system we've sort of uh, accidentally evolved into. Plus, production generates a superstructure of support, you know, political, religious, ideological, and so on, are locked into this uh, System. This uh, that uh, I've been working with a colleague for several years now. And um, again, uh, both of us are sort of starting to see the human economy as one unified system. This, I think, makes it interesting uh, to look at from a political point of view and so on. I mean, uh, you may have to pause for a second. People are saying their audio is off. Oh, okay. Um, does audio? I hear it. Okay, I have two people message me. They don't have audio. Um, Sorry, I'll message everyone again. I mean, sort of an aside, but you know, a lot of us have sort of been scratching our heads and trying to. Uh, oops. Uh, you know, scratching our heads, well, why do the, you know, the poorest people, uh, why are some of the most uh, ardent Trumps? And really, look at it. And first, of all, the bottom, uh, about the bottom percent, <coughs> you know, the bottom's dropped out of the economy in the past few decades. Uh, high school education, or less, their incomes have fallen by about 30 percent in real terms uh, since 1970. And they have most to lose if, they, if their income drops. Um, um, not really don't. I mean, think of Bill Gates. What if he blew, I don't know, $10 billion? I mean, so what? He's not going to bu start buying used cars or stop going out to dinner. I mean, it really doesn't affect him. But if you're making, you know, thirty, forty thousand 40000 a year and your income check is falling, uh, you're in just trouble. So, uh, anyway, so the whole thing, it, uh, it must Okay. The role of government. <clears throat> uh, I learned a lot from uh, another person in this evolution uh, group, Anu Mazzucato. Uh, she's an economist. I think she's still at Bristol University in the UK. Um, uh, one class in an lecture course I gave is sort of break down this myth of the dichotomy between the government and free market. And this sort of pervades economic theory. And environmental uh, economics. Of course, you know, you're represented with free market solutions or command and control solutions. You know, do you want to be free or do you want to be commanded and controlled? The whole land is sort of uh, loaded. But anyway, society, economy, and government really is one unified uh, system. <clears throat> Most all development countries, uh, government spending accounts for between 40 50% of gross domestic product. There are who gets the money and which 
acceptance of the economy or support in which you're not. In care spending, uh, for example, uh, the U.S. spends more, I mean, directly, the government spends directly more per capita on health care than uh, any, country, uh, any other country in the world, yet we have worse results. It's a matter of where the money goes, where the subsidy goes, and so on. Mm-hmm. Education and the okay, Here, government spending is a percent of GDP, and is about 42 percent. These numbers vary according to, to uh, the southern calculated spending at all levels of government, from better state, state and local. It's not where it's really not an outlier. It's actually about the same as Norway, 44 percent. It's not countries like Australia, uh, the same as Canada. Uh, France is an outlier at the other end, very high percentage. Uh, in the same ballpark as the U.S. But, you know, it, this is really surprising when I, when I saw this chart. The least developed economies, the government spending is actually uh, very low, 20%, 16%. So. The, you know, the government, the, the red now are involving health care. So, again, let the market go. It's, you know, it's uh, really bogus, this whole discussion. Of course, the health care sector, it's about 23% federal budget as much as national defense, but again, depending on how you calculate it. Uh, since how the um, money did among the players in the healthcare sector. This last thing, most of the new drugs uh, had by drug companies uh, were developed in government labs or government funded labs. This is called public sector research institutes. Again, every new drug was developed and government using taxpayer money. Uh, this uh, is study published in the uh, one journal of medicine a few years ago. But the private sector uh, gets taxpayer to apply for patents for particular drugs. It's uh, you know, the surplus value of the private sector. This, uh, for those of you that are interested, this YouTube by Mariana Mazzucato is really good. She's very dynamic, very cool. And so the, she's written a book called The Entrepreneurial State, which point uh, real innovation engine in the global economy is not the entrepreneurial class, collecting capitalist trails through the thicket of government red tape and taxation. No, the real engine of innovation is, uh, is government and government spending. <coughs> and uh, developed a diagram about uh, the iPhone. She had a number of products, but this shows a first generation iPod and then an the iPod Touch and the phone. And components of that, every important component and component was developed in a government uh, lab or the department or so on. Uh, DOE, uh, DARPA, U.S. military, and so on. All these technologies really uh, came from, uh, from government spending. Another uh, interesting example. She is, is uh, uh, in the, the, the package that Obama put forth uh, after the crash in 2008. Uh, the government gave these loan, really massive loans uh, to a they call Solyndra, which manufactured panels. And it was half a billion dollars, an amazing amount of money. And the company ended up going bankrupt and become a poster child for conservatives. Use that the government can't pick winners and losers. You know, this is going to happen. Belongs to two companies. The other one was Tesla, and one of the most successful, at least this point, uh, in the economy. Uh, they gave a startup loan that really funded uh, a lot of the research and so on. Um, and the government had the chance, uh, it had an option on shares of Tesla. It could share, you know, the millions of shares at $2 a share. You know, the share price went up, I don't know, $100, something like that, but didn't exercise that option. So anyway, the point uh, Mariana makes is that uh, you look at these government initiatives, the government does things that the private sector can't do. You can imagine, uh, take real mass uh, large amounts of capital that the private sector can do. It should, it should take the benefits of the investments, you know, not only the not only the, uh, the downside. 
I had a quote, yeah, this quote from uh, John Maynard Keynes, important for, for government is not to do things which individuals are doing already and to do them a little better or a little worse, but to do those things which the president has done at all. And again, the countries really successful, countries like China, uh, one reason their economies are booming is because the government can mobilize these massive amounts of capital and um, uh, in specific very large investment projects that the private sector can do. Uh, and taking that a little bit further, um, uh, most environmental policy now concentrates on getting the prices right, and including a lot of economics. You know, get this right and let the market take care of it. And monitoring economic services, same uh, economic uh, ecosystem services, and so on. Uh, this is work I've done with Hannes Lang who's a former student now at a medical university in, in Munich. But I uh, argue that we should consist to be public goods rather than uh, positive externalities to be subsidized. A lot of the based on the work of Daniel Bromley, editor of the uh, of Bromley. He asked that the question is what to protect, not how much to protect uh, at the margin. And again, uh, think about climate change and loss the natural world. Uh, when these things are getting really desperate, we need uh, resolutions. So, I applied this in a study of the Sud wetland in South Sudan. Uh, it's probably the largest uh, wetland in the world. It's bigger, bigger than the Anatel and the Imperium. It's hard to, the largest migration of large animals in the world. There's a, a kind of a little called a cob, white eared cob. And uh, probably the migration uh, is about a million and a half of these animals across that land from the wet season to the dry season. It's also the home to about a million tribal people who depend on the marsh for their, for their livelihoods. Again, this is by a uh, unit. They uh, uh, expressed a uh, uh, really beautiful area. Honestly, we were supposed to do a flyover in 20 but uh, yeah, we do, but we couldn't do the trip because of the work uh, there. <coughs> but it's a sort of ever-changing, uh, meandering of, uh, of plant nation and the streams changing for the course and so on. Uh, this is in the wet season of some of the, uh, the people I like to think of the words of Myrtle and the Shillock, who uh, in the season the cattle go to, to higher ground. This is probably little homesteads for fishermen, families area with a really amazing culture in the next few months. So let's report that the wetland is really a public good. And it's lots of people of, of South Sudan uh, and really people of the Nile Basin, part of a larger uh, Nile Basin initiative. Really, it's a world treasure that's to be protected from uh, private greed. It's been run by a uh, all, courts, all sorts of things, including a and they drain much of the wetland. And uh, uh, oil there, there's oil, oil exploration that's uh, causing damage to illegal logging. And so we have just a uh, case study of uh, how to use markets as economics, if not global markets. So the question is, uh, you know, what can the future of the people of South Sudan Want. What do they want their country to be like in 2050? <clears throat> so the question is, really, what will look like to the people of Sudan, the people living there in 2050, for example? Is it worse now to have a good world in 2050? The question is really within the frame of, of uh, you know, standard economic theory, which discounting a discount future and uh, decisions at the margin. And so on. This is a diagram we came up with. Again, you make the government, some government entity makes a decision uh, that preserves for the public good. Uh, you know, the best science, how the marsh works, the hydrology, the biology, economics of the people living there and potential uses. Then that, you allow a local initiative to, to uh, bubble up from uh, the bottom up. Ecotourism, sustainable forestry, sustainable fisheries. I mean, all these and other uses uh, are compatible with this 
again, ultimate goal of distributing the commodity. To sort of wrap this up, uh, we behavior in government, uh, governments at sort of different levels. The level is certainly important, you know, changing incentives, uh, having people, certainly people to make the right decisions and so on. Uh, social aspect of behavior that people are beginning to look at now. Um, individuals make decisions as members of social groups. And interesting stuff done on uh, what composition of groups make the best decisions. Uh, one study, for example, I think groups of five or six, they gave a hundred of these groups of characteristics of the group that was um, efficient in solving problems. And basically, to most of us, you needed a, a gender balance, you know, not, not dominated by males or females. Uh, and you have good communicative procedures for good communication. So on. So uh, anyway, interesting research being done on that. And uh, the technology is really improving too. When I mean this stuff, uh, you know, I don't know, seven years ago, most of the research was done on individuals in MRI scanners. And I don't know if you've ever been in one of these things, but you know, it's not pleasant. The thing bangs, it's noisy. Much less intrusive ways to uh, measure brain activity. Just a little sort of cap on your head. You can also have groups of five or six people. Uh, and you can look at how you know, uh, light up, you know, brain waves differ uh, if, if you're a member of the group and listening to other members of the group and so on. So technology is revolutionizing behavioral economics and also something called neuro neuroeconomics. And finally, um, the gloomy, relatively little work has been done on sort of the fear of societies. Um, economic base drives social attitudes, what are the different conflicting uh, intergroups, uh, how, is, how is power um, gained and, and, um, and arranged in a whole scale society, large scale society. A lot of interesting stuff being published. Most of you have a book by Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in the 21st Century. It talks about these long one run, uh, or even centuries long trends. There's a really good book that just came out that I'm in the middle of by uh, and it's about uh, sort of the growth of inequality uh, through throughout history. Leveler being, and his basic thesis, his name is Walter Scheidel, his thesis is there's a natural tendency for inequality that's usually only broken by catastrophic events, you know, wars, plagues, uh, revolutions, and so on. Anyway, big stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, questions? And... Email address. Uh, be free to contact me. People type the questions in the chat, or if you want, you can unmute yourself to ask the question. In one slide, we're letting everyone think, um, and just let you know that our next uh, USSEE webinar uh, is scheduled for Wednesday, April 18th at 1 p.m. for that one, and that will be a discussion on the ecological economics of climate change by Jim Kahn. Uh, this webinar is geared towards anyone from undergrads working in production. This is sort of an overview of how ecological economists uh, look at climate change. To jump back to John for questions. Would you view the relationship between the ultimatum game and climate change? Uh, yeah, well, there's two things. One thing is the importance of, uh, of different cultures understanding how people make economic decisions. Uh, let me just give kind of a, a couple of examples. Uh, culture studied uh, was uh, in New Guinea, the, you know, sort of a very small agriculture. But 
Plant Societies, uh, I think it was called uh, AU, um, AUA, <clears throat> but the cultures are called big man cultures. And so you get status there is to make a big show of giving things away. Welfare is measured in the number of pigs you have. And so you establish your, your rank by giving, giving someone having a big feast or give someone pigs. So it offers there in the ultimatum game were like 60, 70, 80 percent, and these offers were usually rejected. And the reason for that, you know, suppose I'm a big man, I give you three pigs, and you reject that because it's my way of saying, okay, I'm asserting my dominance over you, and you're not going to do it. Um, there are, there's another culture, uh, uh, the whaling culture called La Mer. I think it was also uh, off the coast of New Guinea. And uh, they divided um, everything equally. Almost everyone gave half, some gave more. So it depends on uh, fishermen hunting uh, these small whales. And uh, if a group of men catch a whale, I mean, you know, they can't eat the whole thing. So they share it, uh, and they're very average about how to share the um, the catch and so on. The high Tanzania, this is one of the last remaining hunter gathered cultures, the desert area in Tanzania, and they low offers, and the law offers are usually rejected, which is because hunter gathers are noted for being really egalitarian. The reason for that, again, they hunted small game, and it was usually small groups of women, small groups of men, or men alone, <coughs> catching small game in the spot. And they, you know, have a habit to arguing over everything and complain. One of the anthropologists there called them the Kvetches of the, of the Serengeti. Anyway, uh, so the point is, that I think in, in terms of uh, uh, climate change, uh, how, to make, how to get countries with very different values. I mean, country many in England, uh, the United States, that are pretty close culturally, have very different uh, attitudes about uh, sociology. And so on, social nature. Uh, um, a person at, at um, NAU, Jennifer Jacquette, uh, has done a lot of work on uh, playing these kinds of games, uh, or simulating uh, games played with world leaders and representing different countries about optimally designed policies about climate change using game theory. So, anyway, so that's, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, being done. One more question. First is from uh, Madhav Bhatt, and he says, could you elaborate a bit on different forms of social group as they affect resource-based behavior? Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, that this, uh, this question sort of opens up to about, about current politics and uh, coloration and all that. But I, um, I think the key is, <coughs> and I've been watching this debate about uh, and uh, there's a, a group of people, uh, it's Mayor Bloomberg, so, but he's sort of finance getting groups together, you know, people who want to ban all guns and gun owners who think, uh, you know, they ban at any restriction that at all is undermining the Second Amendment. But recently, if you get groups together in small face-to-face uh, -face groups, they can come to agreement, uh, and it's like, you know, not assault weapons to uh, people uh, you know, committed to this crime, violent crimes, and uh, they're mentally ill, and so on. So uh, I think, you know, again, the problem is how to scale that up, and I don't, I don't know if it can be done or not, but uh, I think a lot of the stuff from the economics, and especially uh, neuroeconomics, is really, really important. Talk about neuroeconomics, probably the leader there is a guy named Colin Hammer at Caltech. But he looked at kind of um, sort of economic questions in, uh, in very sort of innovative and unique ways. And rather, for example, rather than, than maximizing utility, uh, the real question is something called homeostasis. I mean, people make decisions to keep a mental state in balance or their you know, their minds and so on. He's used that. Uh, I'm getting a little bit off track, but he's used that concept to uh, look at how people make decisions about. Discounting the parents about money, uh, he's really selfish and sort of prejudiced and so on. If you're hearing the question in terms of you know, things like climate change and say biodiversity, 
a different part of your brain actually lights up, and people, physicians, are willing to make sacrifices based on sort of long-term interest rather than short-term interest. A question from Laura John, how would you recommend pushing the ideological shift of large environmental features to be public? I think really, I mean, first of all, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, this, you should look at that lecture by Mario Mazzucato about the realm of government. I mean, she makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, she has debates with these uh, sort of free market options. And Jeff Royston, actually, I mean, it's kind of, I hope I never have to debate it. But, I mean, it's really, it should be just common sense. I mean, if you want to protect something like the Sioux and wetland, it's just, uh, you know, shifting away, well, how much of this part should we use, how much of that part, you know, 10 to 50%, 20%. You need to preserve the whole same thing in an intact way. And uh, so, uh, I think, I mean, I'm thinking, what can I do? I mean, some retired college professor, I can write papers and write reports. I don't know how much of them. Uh, they can have. Uh, what I've been doing is trying to influence uh, local politicians. Uh, <clears throat> there's actually, I went to a uh, uh, thing two days ago, two nights ago, it was one of the, the candidates for the, in the Democratic primary in the Silicon County. And uh, he was very, I don't know if he'll win or not, I think he probably has to, you know, he was very, I mentioned that, that idea, so there's all the government and all that. Instead of making an argument against government versus the market and trying to get the role of government, say, spending your money, it's a question of what it spends on. And so it's also a very ardent environmental. So he wins. So it was very interesting to talk to me about the screws. I don't know. I wish uh, I had an answer to that, but uh, I sort of really flipping the flipping the thing. The whole public goods question. Uh, I think it's interesting because it really flips from putting a price on nature uh, and how much are you willing to spend as an individual to how much are uh, you willing to spend as a society. Just to say one more thing, I'm kind of getting off the track with that. But, but if something is like an, an externality, uh, economic theory, you uh, just add up how much people are willing to pay, how much am I willing to pay by myself, how much is Aaron willing to pay. Uh, by herself and, and so on. The question of the public good is really is how much are you willing to pay if you know everybody else is going to pay, pay too? It's not different. I mean, most people I think would pay a lot, a lot more. I, mean, I don't know. Why well, give a thousand dollars to combat climate change? What difference is that going to make? Probably nothing. But if in the country gets a thousand dollars, and I'm going to will you like that or not? And I'm Students in intro to the course. That's an interesting question. Uh, there's a, a yeah, a lot of people. Um, well, I think first we should have an interdisciplinary course with an economist, uh, climate change person, uh, and just about the effects of climate change. We had like that at RPI uh, uh, years ago, but other people retired too. But yeah, a multidisciplinary perspective is really important. And I think also, let me do sort of a light criticism of, of economics. Uh, there's a paper in um, Journal of Economic Perspective a couple of years ago, and it was called The Superiority of Economics. It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek article by a couple of us from France. It did a, an analysis of uh, social science disciplines, economics, anthropology, political science, sociology, uh, and found that uh, economic profession is really isolated compared to other disciplines. They look at in the top journals, like American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy. What percentage is from other top journals and other economic journals? It was overwhelmingly from economic journals. Others like anthropology, quotations in their papers were from likely to be from sociology, even biology, you know, a higher percentage of non-anthropology 
journals. Uh, board of Directors of the, the, the uh, Association for Economic uh, for Anthropology is called. It was represented. It had a much more variety of schools, and it's really three or four departments that uh, control the journals. Journal of Political Economy is run out of the University of Chicago. Quarterly Journal of Economics, MIT, and so on. So, uh, so uh, needs to be much broader. I'll get to that. There's this in the New York Times about women in economics, and the percentage is actually falling. The, the thing, the attitudes of female economists versus male economists. For example, a uh, question I can't remember exactly, but do you think the, the role of the government should be uh, reduced? Males overwhelmingly yes, females overwhelmingly no. So uh, it's a uh, Again, it's a narrowing of the same perspective. One more question, if anyone has anything final that they'd like to ask. And of course, today, um, the things we do at USSC help facilitate research collaborations and get people who are working on this that might be the only person working on this at their university talking to others. People with similar interests. Excellent, and please be in touch, and good luck to all of you and whatever you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Karen. And to make the uh, we'll make this report available on our website. We'll send all of you that were here today a link as soon as we get that all sorted out. So I apologize for the uh, hospital Wi-Fi system. It <laughs> yeah, so me yeah. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> You're really super for doing that. <laughs> Great, Ben. All right. Adios. Thank you. I want to make sure about the recording I, to myself, and I hope that it did not. I think it's up to the recording for a few minutes. I'll take a look. We can take a look through once you get it and see. Um, can you drop it on our Google Drive and be able to get it? Yep. About 53 minutes, and I think uh, we lost a few. Okay. Stop recording now and.